Today I'm going to present under the title Navigating the Borderlands of Human and Companion Animal Healthcare in the Context of Antibiotic Stewardship. I'll briefly outline the problem of antibiotic resistance and the concept of One Health, and I'll then draw on some of my PhD research to discuss different lay constructions of health and illness across species boundaries and the challenges faced when accessing routine care, pulling this together with some examples of how these points impact upon antibiotic stewardship. Antibiotic resistance as a healthcare issue is the social manifestation of a biological process. The biological process at the heart of antibiotic resistance is the evolution of evasion strategies by bacteria to overcome chemical and environmental challenges, such as exposure to antibiotic medication. Where there's an intersection between this evolution and the failure by humans to treat an infection using antibiotic medication, the lack of susceptibility becomes antibiotic resistance. In other words, the pathogenic bacteria in question is not susceptible to the medication used to treat it. The same antibiotics are used in humans and animals, with 36% of antibiotics used in 2017 being sold for use in animals and 64% being prescribed for use in humans. The conditions that underlie poor antibiotic stewardship and promote antibiotic resistance, as well as the conditions that militate against antibiotic resistance, are deeply social and shaped by cultural, political and economic processes. These conditions include the behaviours of prescribers, such as general practitioners or veterinarians, the settings in which they're prescribed, such as highly time pressured free at point of use GP, GP practices or finance conscious veterinary practices, as well as the behaviour of consumers, such as patients, parents, pet owners and farmers. Recent social science literature has also suggested an element of co-production of antibiotic stewardship behaviours between companion animals and their owners. The concept of One Health has become a linchpin of public health approaches to addressing antibiotic resistance around the world. A contemporary definition of One Health proposed by the One Health Commission and adopted by the UK One Health Coordination Group is a collaborative, multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach, working at local, regional, national and global levels to achieve optimal health and well-being outcomes, recognising the interconnections between people, animals, plants and their shared environment. The concept has had penetration in a number of areas of healthcare, as highlighted by a November 2019 report by the British Veterinary Association. The report highlights case studies integrating companion animals into mental health and wellbeing, the integration of access to GP care and companion animal care, responding to zoonotic infections, crafting environmental policy, and of course, addressing antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance itself has been described as the quintessential One Health issue, due to the potential for transmission of resistance between human and animal species through shared environments and the consequent need to address human, animal and environmental healths as one to address antimicrobial resistance effectively. Interventions to address antimicrobial resistance in the UK have adopted a One Health approach, with the government's antimicrobial resistance strategies being jointly led by the former Public Health England, the Department for Health and Social Care, and the Department for the Environment and Rural Affairs. Continuing with interconnected health, there's some context-specific evidence that pet owners draw connections between companion animal health and their own health as humans, but that similar conditions may be experienced very differently depending on the species that's living with them. Melanie Rock, for example, has highlighted from ethnographic work that companion animals exemplify life with diabetes for many people. And for those of her participants who lived with diabetes themselves, there were parallels being drawn between their own diagnoses and care and their companion animals' health care needs. Experiencing diabetes exclusively through one's companion animal, however, as several of Rock's participants were, is a markedly different experience to living with diabetes as a human. The considerations and practice that are navigated in the management of a dog's diabetes for a pet owner, for example, the cost and stress of veterinary visits and the task of medicating a pet, are differently challenging than those of people managing their own diabetes, despite similar antecedent conditions and treatments for the condition in each sphere of care. In another example, in the context of blood donation, Ashall and Hobbs and West found that pet owners' narratives around the donation of canine blood entangled human and non-human animals as a way of doing good by proxy, leading the authors to argue that decision-making in healthcare more generally might be influenced by experiences at the veterinary clinic and vice versa. 
Whilst there are evidently some distinctions between human and companion animal healthcare, for example in terms of dependence, accessibility and the legal status of patients, there are also areas exhibiting potential for the breaking down of conceptual and categorical borders. And for the remainder of my presentation, I'll be examining the extent of these spillovers and frictions in my participants' narratives around interspecies health and healthcare access, concluding with their implications for antibiotic stewardship in the UK. The translation of health between species contexts was an inconsistent phenomenon. Different participants drew on very similar rationales or areas to explain why they felt connecting human and animal health was either natural or transgressive. One example of connection came from a participant who lived with seasonal affective disorder and identified the same symptoms and response to a therapy lamp in one of their cats. I kind of looked it up, she said. Can cats get winter depression? It turns out they can because they have the same sorts of brain chemicals as us, which is like what the light and darkness cycles are set in humans. So it's the same in cats. So I put my light on sometimes and he'll come and sit with me and he seems to actually quite like it. It wasn't something that I'd have known if it hadn't happened to me already. Commonalities between pharmaceutical products marketed for humans or for other animals were another area where some participants drew connections ranging from antibiotics to shampoo and dermatological medications. In these examples, participants tended to move from similarities between conditions to similarities between medications. In a specific example, participants in favour of vaccination for themselves exhibited different attitudes towards companion animals. In one example, a participant stated that annual vaccinations, which I know not everyone agrees with, I just think I vaccinate myself when I go on holiday and if you're sort of doing the tighter test that they do to see if the vaccinations are needed for my dog, that's a lot of faffing around. I can't see the vaccinations have had any negative impact for him or any of my previous dogs, so it just seems sensible to go with that. Whilst another participant reflected, I suppose I'd probably skimp more on him, the cat, than I would on my own health. For example, with vaccinations, I'd always have vaccinations that I needed Whereas for him, because he didn't go outside, he doesn't mix with other animals, he's not up to date with his vaccinations. Other participants considered human and animal health as explicitly separate issues based on broadly the same areas. For example, one participant rationalised this separation based on the toxicity of paracetamol for cats, while other participants pointed to vague physiological differences like, quote, different systems or, quote, different processes or suggesting that beyond, quote, having the same tools like hearts and lungs, end quote, humans and animals are physiologically incomparable. So whilst One Health as a policy framing works to integrate human, animal and environmental health at an institutional level, pet owners don't necessarily exhibit a lived understanding of this oneness of health in their own reflections and behaviours. Turning to the practicalities of accessing general practitioner care in medical and veterinary settings, I'm going to outline three borders constructed within my participants' narratives. Firstly, the issue of being a third party in a veterinary consultation. Secondly, borders between sites of care and the presentation of antibiotic stewardship. And thirdly, practical borders between the administration of antibiotics in medical and veterinary care. The experience of being a third party in veterinary consultations is something that came up repeatedly in participants' narratives regarding the development of trust with veterinarians, sometimes specifically juxtaposed to the process of developing trust with a doctor. Being a third party for some participants meant that they felt a greater level of trust in the processes of medical care rather than veterinary. One participant, for example, highlighted the communicative aspect of this third party experience saying, I think I trust my doctor more than a vet, simply for the fact that we can communicate better with a doctor than a vet can communicate with a pet. For a different participant, the rationale is more protective. I think it's probably a bit more trust with the doctor because it's me rather than me caring for somebody else. This difference in attitude was juxtaposed with material differences in behaviour discussed by other participants, reflecting that they would be quicker to take up treatment options for their companion animals than themselves, or adhere to companion animal treatment, and would be more comfortable with being sent away with no medication for themselves than they would for their companions. So in this first example, they say, if it's me, I know how I'm feeling, and I know if I can put up with it or not, and I know how much it's bothering me. I go for treatment options for the dog more quickly than I do for myself just because I don't know, they can't tell you how bad it is. In other examples, 
It might be more compassionate, if you like, to use the antibiotics as the first line of defense in the animal, but more viable because humans are more sentient to say, would you mind trying something else first? Or it's even worse than a child because the dog doesn't talk. So when he's got a problem and I trust the vet he has a problem, I completely go on information that has been given to me, so I can't leave anything out on my own judgment. The distinctions drawn here by participants between their own healthcare and its embodied experiential elements and the lack of a clear equivalent in the context of their companion animal's health show that underlying perceptions of health in different species contexts have some bearing on individual rationalizations regarding antibiotic stewardship, as these contexts are separated by the role of embodied feelings in making healthcare decisions. Pet owners in my sample felt there was no messaging really around antibiotic resistance in the context of companion animal care, with specific attributions to the role of sites of care here. The absence of veterinarians as a source of information about antibiotic resistance was both implicit from the lack of mention by some participants, as well as explicitly reflected upon, evidenced also in participants' reflections on what they learned from professional sites of healthcare, such as GP surgeries and veterinary practices. So in this example, I've not heard as much generally from either my vet or in the press around animals being resistant to antibiotics as you do around humans. So yeah, if I go to the doctor's surgery, there are posters up telling me that antibiotics won't work for flu or cold, so I shouldn't be asking for them. But there doesn't seem to be the same prevalence of information in the vets. I was there today, so I can tell you there's not a single sign about not over-prescribing antibiotics for animals in my vet surgery. In another example, it's all over GP surgeries. I don't think I've ever seen it at the vet. So alongside the difficulties of accessing veterinary care then, there's also a perceived lack of information coming from veterinarians about antibiotic resistance in contrast to GP surgeries. Finally, the difficulties of administering antibiotics in pill form to companion animals were a common feature of participants' narratives. Cats in particular were highlighted as being quite tricksy compared to dogs, often avoiding swallowing pills and spitting them out in choice spots around the house later on. In some cases, participants recounted physical difficulties in even getting a pill into a cat in the first instance. In a quote that I suspect may resonate with some people listening, you had to wrap him in a towel so he couldn't claw you, and then you had to try and force his mouth open and get the pill in and hold his mouth shut until he swallowed it. And even then, sometimes he'd spit it out, like 10 minutes later, it was a real battle. So this trickiness of companion animals adds a layer to the stresses related to accessing veterinary care in the first place. There are initial hurdles to accessing care and acquiring the appropriate treatment, but once outside the border of the practice and away from the professional setting, there are specific difficulties with administering antibiotics as a form of companion animal care. Whilst participants often had strategies for getting pills into their companion animals, predominantly involving cheese, ham or tuna, for others like this participant, it was a battle. This difficulty meant that sometimes participants did not give their companions the full course of antibiotics in order to avoid distress. So here, if it's clearly causing real distress and they won't eat the pill without you basically like using some sort of contraption to hold their mouth open, then I wouldn't force it down. So I give them a few misses in the sense that I don't want to upset my cat to the point that she doesn't come home one day. Though some participants struggled with their companions, others circumvented the problem by paying for veterinary injected antibiotics. Injected antibiotics were explicitly enrolled as a solution to the difficulties of administering pills personally. So in this quotation, vet injected, as I can't get pills into the cat. You know, she's the most beautiful, placid, calm, lovely pussycat, sat in the car for four hours trying to suffolk, and she hardly made a sound. But once you try getting a pill down her, and she turns into the most vicious, vile animal, so I don't even try now. In another example, I've attempted to give her pills, but I've always paid extra to get the injections rather than giving her pills because she's far too clever for her own good. She eats around the food and the tablet and she spits it back out. This approach incurs extra financial costs for the pet owner whilst alleviating the stress of doing battle with a companion animal. This approach also increases the potential societal cost of treatment in the context of antibiotic resistance, as the injected doses are less flexible and often longer duration and with broader spectrums than you get with orally administered antibiotic courses. In conclusion, the antibiotic stewardship practiced by pet owners must navigate a number of borderlands between human and companion animal care. Underlying these areas are pet owners' own perceptions of what health is in human and non-human healthcare contexts. Perceptions that are themselves occasionally plural, with participants drawing their own borders around what health means in different contexts. On a more conceptual level, 
My research argues that we should be critical of the lived understanding of health in pet owning publics when thinking about antibiotic stewardship interventions in medical and veterinary contexts. The policy relevant principles of a borderless One Health don't necessarily consistently translate to lay understandings or experiences of antibiotic consumption and antibiotic resistance in personal and pet orientated healthcare contexts. Thank you for listening. I look forward to engaging with your questions.